All right. Is that? Great. So tonight's uh, training is about charting, or um, as you'll also hear us refer to it, mapping. We, we've kind of been using the two terms um, interchangeably. Um, so just for what we've already gone over in past trainings about structured organizing conversations really quickly, um, one of our main goals for as long as we are going to be around, which is hopefully forever, um, is constantly recruiting and always trying to grow the power of the union, which means growing the membership of the union. Um, so the five basics of organizing our union and growing its power. The first is no one joins the union unless they are individually approached and asked to join. So if you never ask someone to join, you never give them the chance to say yes, which means you've essentially made up their mind for them. You've decided they're not going to join. So we always wanna ask. The more people who are asked to join, the more people who will join. You cannot get hundreds of workers to join the union unless you have hundreds asking. You cannot get hundreds asking people without strong organizing committees. And you cannot have strong functioning organizing committees unless people are meeting regularly, making plans, working with lists, doing charts, taking assignments and reporting. So tonight we're gonna to focus on that doing charts and to some extent working with lists aspect of it, which is really, really important for a couple of reasons. Um, the first is that it makes us approach, we're organizing our workplaces in a more deliberate and systematic way. Um, so UVA employs at least, I think, 28,000 people alone. Um, and we have school, other universities represented here tonight who I'm sure also have significant workforces. Um, oftentimes they're the largest employers in their region, um, if, not, if not the largest, then among the largest, right? Universities are very big employers. Um, and, and, you know, even though we, 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 we know we're very powerful already in terms of what we're able to leverage and get done, um, we are relatively small minorities within those workforces, right? So the way we grow our power um, in an organized and systematic way is by charting our workplaces. Charting helps us approach the organizing conversations that we've talked about having, um, those one-to-one -one recruiting conversations we have with friends and coworkers. In, in a deliberate way by answering the following questions. Who have we already spoken to and what were their responses? Who should we speak to first when we're looking for um, potential recruits? Who should we save for last? So who do we wait to build power before we approach? And who should we absolutely avoid? Just who's gonna be counterintuitive to talk to or um, who might you know, get in the way of our organizing efforts if they know more about what's going on, right? And this is all really important information that we wanna be sharing within our departments in order to make sure that everyone's on the same page. So what does a chart look like? Um, so I, I drew up this very basic sample chart with a few members of UCW Virginia UVA's steering committee um, to give you an idea of the kind of information you might wanna have in, in a workplace chart. Um, so obviously you want their name, you want their contact information so you know how to get a hold of them. And then the thing to, uh, I'll, I'll point you to is the assessment. So you can see a few numbers there, one through four, and I'll, I'll touch more on that in a moment. Um, you can see on the right-hand side, the assessment key, just go ahead and take a look at that. So one is ready to join, two is unsure, undecided, three is support but can't or won't join, and four is anti-union. So pretty self-explanatory. Um, the other thing that charts help us do is map social and work relationships within a department. So you want to establish, and friends can be used very loosely, right? You don't have to be like bosom buddies, but like maybe you, they go to lunch with this person constantly, or um, they're, they always have each other's back in department meetings, or they work the same shift, right? So you can substitute friend for like circle of acquaintances, um, people who can move them or be moved by them, right? Um, and out of those friends, you probably want to select just one, maybe two point people um, to serve as their primary uh, point of contact with the union before they've joined. Um, I, I say one or two so that people don't feel like they're being inundated by like a lot of different voices um, so they don't get overwhelmed. But sometimes having a backup person is helpful, right? Um, one person talks to them and then another person maybe follows up later, gives them a sense that there's just more than one person at work in the department who's involved in the union. That sometimes can be an asset. Um, and then, you know, it's always good to have notes, you know, either for yourself or for others to just let you know where you are in the conversation. Um, also, just speaking for myself in the history department at UVA, we've had a lot of success with charts. 
Um, they help us hold each other accountable to recruiting. When we meet every month or so, we're able to say like, were you able to follow up with this person? Because I see you put yourself down as the point. Um, and, and that definitely has incentivized me to follow through on my promises. When I say I'm gonna talk to this person, I have to like pull myself together and actually do it because I know four or five other people are gonna ask me about it in a week or so. So um, let's see, do I have more to talk about? Is this still me or is someone else supposed to take over? Ida, do you know? I think it's still you, but while we're pausing, let me show off this actual chart. Speaking of what do charts look like, they look like this. Yes. Yeah, you definitely don't have to use uh, Google Sheets the, the way we've been doing. Um, it's definitely a little bit easier in, in the time that we're in right now with the pandemic, but Ida has physical charts. And if you wanna get a hold of one, we'll tell you about how to do that um, in a moment. Um, so going back to that one through four assessment key, um, how do we assess our coworkers? It's, it's obviously a kind of like fuzzy process, right? Because people are complicated and people have various different reasons for maybe wanting or not wanting to join the union. But there are some basic kind of common sense ways you can approach it. The first is to definitely start with people you are close with and know well. Um, there's usually at least one or two people in your work department, even if you don't have any close friends who you might have some greater familiarity with. And if they seem like people who you can safely approach and have an organizing conversation with, definitely start with them. And from there, you can build ever expanding networks, right? This is where the friends or point person column really comes in handy because you can find out who your friends' friends are, who they may know that you've never talked to. Um, the, the important thing to remember here is that you should spend most of your time and energy focusing on twos and threes, right? Ones are the easy ones, they're the gimmies. Um, you don't wanna sink too much time and energy into uh, uh, talking to them because hopefully those conversations should be very quick. You also don't wanna to waste too much time on fours, right? They should be a no-go, at least for now. Um, you don't need to sink a lot of time or energy trying to convince someone who doesn't really want to be convinced or who might even make your job harder for you. Um, I'll just point out that threes can sometimes be really hard and you may not always move them because they may have really like genuine problems of safety or um, other kinds of risk that they're worried about in terms of joining. I know a lot of international graduate students are really worried about uh, joining the union for visa reasons. These are legitimate. Um, in those conversations, um, and we've touched on this in other trainings before, you can always offer other ways for them to support and be involved in the union that don't involve becoming a fully fledged member. Um, whether that's signing uh, public petitions that we put out or showing up at in-person actions when we have them. Um, so there are ways for people to become uh, friends of the union without becoming dues paying members. Okay, great. Now I think I'm turning it over. Yes, it me. So I love that phrase you just said, Crystal, of we don't want to be spending, sinking, sinking not too much time into the ones um, because it sets me up really well to say why. Not because ones are not valuable people. We do actually want to build super majorities if we want to do the kinds of power, like the kinds of powerful actions that we do want to do. We want like 90% participation in the entire workforce of UVA or 100% participation, which is everybody, including ones. But you should not worry about sinking too much of your time into ones because that is the organic leader's job. Your job is to find out who that is because they are the person who can move everyone around them, including those ones, into whatever action it is that we want to see happen. We have just collectively decided that we're going to do. So what is the organic leader? It is the person in, the, in your workplace who has people's trust and respect and who has shown themselves to, to be a leader, to be the person who, when they show up and say, sign this petition, um, you will do it. You might look into it, read up on it and then do it. Or you might say, I trust this person's opinion. I think that this is gonna be worthwhile or I think that this is something that I can believe in. And then you just do it. Identifying leaders is not, doesn't have to be and should not be guesswork or speculation. It's not who do I think people will follow. It's who has already shown this in my workplace. That's who the leader is. And I say that because um, it's, it's pretty easy to get wrong at first because it's not the same as activist. So the leader in your workplace, in your department or your unit or whatever like group of people it is that you are recruiting inside of is not often the person who is the most enthusiastic about the union. That would be the activist, but the activist isn't necessarily who's respected in their workplace, who people look up to and will follow and who can um, talk to everyone in a way that makes everyone participate. The activist is just that. 
enthusiastic, which can be great. But in some cases, the activist is in fact so poorly respected that having them on your side kind of gives you a bad rap. So that's something to watch out for. You want the person who will move people with you, not against you. And that can happen. This is the other reason we need organic leaders. They can move people. So if you spend all of your time on getting the easy people to stand with you, do the things, and then you don't get the organic leader, you do something the organic leader doesn't like, they're going to move everyone who you previously had with you, not with you anymore. So we can't afford to not have organic leaders with us when we do things. That's why we need them. Also, so that you know, all of us don't go crazy trying to get every single person. We need to um, let let other people help us do do the recruiting work. Okay, so the last point on the slide, leaders are not necessarily pro-union. In fact, they may be more likely to feel that they don't need the union was really counterintuitive for me when I first learned it. But it makes sense because these are the people who have already learned that they have power in their workplace. So they've already seen their own power in convincing people to go along with what it is that they need. Not only do they know that and can they do that for themselves, their boss knows that. So whoever is overseeing this workplace can tell who other people follow, and they will often also make sure that that organic leader is a person who is satisfied in the job, because when they are dissatisfied, they can make trouble, unlike people who are less respected. So, yes, how do we find them? First of all, nobody outside of the department can look inside and tell you who the organic leader in your department is. So it's not from the outside. This is why you organize in your own workplace with your own coworkers. So if you don't already know who this is, right, so what Chris will just put in the chat, they have relatively privileged positions, they get the best shifts, their complaints are addressed. If you don't already know who this is, look for signs like that because that is a pretty good indicator. The other way to find out is asking people, who do you trust? Who do you go to for advice? Who do you, or if it's someone in the union and you are with your coworkers organizing and you're you, like a good chunk of you are already members, they should also know what an organic leader is and what you're looking for. So ask them, who do you think the organic leader is? Put your experiences together and, and build a picture of what's going on. And the other way to figure this out is structure tests. So we're going to talk more about that in a moment. What I really want to say about this slide, how do we find organic leaders? There are two questions in here. One is, how do you know them when you see them? And the other is, how to get to see them? So this is the how do you know them when you see them? They have the privileged position, they're, they're trusted, they're respected, they move people. How do you get to see them if you haven't already? The answer to that is structure tests, which will be the segment after this in this training. So yes, so... How do you know them when you see them? Let's practice organic leader identification. We are, I think, not gonna go into breakout rooms for this because there's not that many of us, so we don't need to. Um, but we are going to use a set of instructions from that slide. We're there. Thank you, Crystal, put it in the chat. So, we're gonna spend, I think, 20 minutes, follow that link, pull up that Google Doc. We're gonna spend 20 minutes going through it. What you'll see is a set of names. So based on what you have read in this scenario, who is the organic leader who has moved people the most? Uh Sharon, some people are nodding. Any other suggestions? So Gabriel, why Sharon? Well, uh, she, um was able, she has the ear of the president and she doesn't need the union, um, was able to make changes uh, when they tried to raise a fee, got uh, 40 members of the staff on all four campuses together in a meeting, uh, got 60% of them to sign a petition. So 
Yeah. Yeah, that's good. So you're using two pieces of evidence. One is she thinks she doesn't need the union, which is a sign. And the other is she are, we know that she has numbers. And in fact, majority, she got 60%. Yes, I have no problem with that answer. Um, what about the next one? So if we agree that Sharon is our organic leader, what's the order of people that we want to meet with of everybody? Um, I would not prioritize people who are already clearly enthusiastic about the union. Um, so I think that means the second would be Paul Cooper, uh, just because it's he seems like he is respected and doesn't sort of have a clear pro-union stance. Um, then maybe Diego, uh, no, sorry, then maybe Destiny, then maybe Diego, essentially just going in reverse order of clear union support. That was my answer. So Sharon, Paul, uh, Destiny Diego. Any other answers? I think I would do Diego because he's low hanging fruit. And everybody knows him and likes him. He knows a lot of people. He moves around to all the different offices. So um, he might be someone to recruit to do some more recruiting. So I want to get him out of the way. I would go to Paul second because he's also moving around, knows a lot of people, um, and, and is not quite at Sharon's level of leader status, but He's also can get stuff done. Then maybe Destiny and I do Sharon last. Why Destiny and Sharon in that in that order? Um. Well, Destiny is somewhat low hanging fruit in that she's like dispositionally pro union. Um, she's been worked for the, she's been like a rep steward. Um, she also thinks everyone's entitled to their own opinions. So she's not going to be someone who's going to move a lot of other people into my column, but she is a person I could probably move into my column. And then Sharon last. Any other answers? So we have one option that is Sharon first because she's the most important. And then we have another option that is Sharon completely last. <laughs> I assume for the same reason. Where do the rest of you fall? Sharon first, Sharon last. Sharon. Sharon last. Sharon last. Why? Well, if you're going in the order of like the one, two, three, four, I would say Diego is the number one. Sharon is the number four. But you want to focus on the twos and threes. I'm gonna find out who's the twos and threes. So I'd probably go with Paul first. Gotcha. We do also have other information, which is that Destiny is pro-union and Sharon's friend. So there might be a reason to talk to her and before Sharon in whatever order that is in the overall process. Yes, absolutely. Yes, if we know that Sharon is gonna be hard to get, we want people that she's gonna listen to to come with us when we have that conversation. Yeah, that's super correct. The natural born, whatever, organic leader, uh, are they, it seems to me like 
when you get them, you can get a lot of other people to come along, but they're not going to come along unless they feel, and they might feel threatened if you have all these other people there, like, like they are so suddenly losing them, their, their position as this kind of locus of power. Mm. And then, and so they may come along just in order to reestablish their locus of power, or they may oppose to reestablish their locus of power. And it's, that's a gamble. That's always the gamble there. That I think, okay, so there are two things in there. One is like, do you want people to come along for that conversation? And I think that that depends on who your Sharon is. I think in this particular scenario with the information that they've given us, it would be a good idea to at least have destiny on your side. But the other thing you're asking is, um, how does that organizing conversation go? Because ideally in a structured organizing conversation, you don't just convince someone to do a thing with you. You also like agitate around the stuff that they really care about, give them the vision of how to do it. And the vision is with us all together. So if, if you end up in a situation where Sharon is threatened to the point where she wants to break away and reestablish her power, then that organizing conversation has gone very badly pear-shaped. <laughs> <laughs> which is which can happen that's that's super real <laughs> um just that that's a problem with like things internal to that conversation i think and not mapping strategy necessarily or like leader id you have correctly identified sharon i would also just say that um like sharon so far has only been able to exert power um, within a certain sector of the university, like among staff. And so maybe bringing in like non-staff members and just saying like, Sharon, like the union is a way for you to help reach and organize people who aren't like university staff. You know, you can help reach all these other workers. Um, you clearly care about these issues and that's why you're so motivated to do something about them. Um, the union is not really like an outside entity that is coming to like co-opt you or displace you. We want to give you a venue for where you can expand your influence, um, which if that's something she cares about might be a way to reach her. Unless she really just cares about power. But even if she really just cares about power, the avenue to greatest power is 100% participation in our actions. So she should still be with us in my humble organizing opinion. So, okay, consensus around Sharon last. We want destiny before Sharon. What about the order of Paul and Diego? And we want Paul and Diego before, before destiny maybe? Definitely before Sharon. What about that order? I think Paul before Diego, um, so we can gauge where Paul's at and maybe if a second conversation is required. But I don't know about destiny, like before or after destiny. Okay. Paul before Diego because he might take longer. Yeah. And then destiny somewhere. Other answers? I think someone else earlier said to do Diego first because he's already very hoorah about the union and is a very mobile employee. So he can help you spread the word. Um, so he can, he's maybe like a 10 minute conversation at the most, like just get him up to date on where you're at and then he can help you spread the word. Mm -hmm. But isn't he already going to all the union meetings and he's already kind of in, mostly involved? Yes, is that an argument for Diego first or not? No, not first, because he's already kind of roped in. But he is roped in. He's not a member yet, but he goes to all the meetings or he is a member that's just not listed. He comes to, I assume he's a member, comes to most of the union meetings. But he's not participating in the action, I guess. Hmm. Yeah, you still have to you still have to have a conversation with him. 
we can't just leave Diego off of off of the list. The list of ordering. Okay, so there's competing logics here. One logic is Paul will take longer, start Paul first so that you get Paul. And then the other logic is Diego is more useful to have first because he does other things. He will do other things quickly. What do you guys think? I'm still going with Diego first. If I get him, I'll feel good. Oh, I got somebody. Then that will give me the chutzpah to go talk to Paul. Um, I think also because Diego is so friendly, right? <clears throat> and is so, I might be cheating, sorry, I know the answers, but because uh, <laughs> he's also traveling right between campuses and stuff. He likely knows a lot of people. He likely has a lot of information like about people's personal lives or like things they've been complaining about. He's, he's a rich source of information. I think that's um, that's critical before going into these more unknown um, conversations. That's also what I would say. Not only can he do a lot of work for you once he's on board to have these recruiting conversations, he can set you up potentially to do a much better job of the later recruiting conversations. Like Paul, who might be harder. You don't actually know. There's a lot we don't know about Paul. So yeah, I like that. I'm down for that. Diego, Paul, at some point, Sharon, where in there are we putting destiny? I think Phoebe had it when um, they said that destiny should go before Sharon because the two of them have a relationship. Okay, everybody is nodding. Yeah. Yes, cool. The, the other thing to notice yeah, Paul and Destiny were interchangeable in two and three. Yeah. I would say that the thing that makes me want to put Destiny maybe the last before Sharon, so in position three, is that she must have had some reason why she stopped being as involved with the union. So there might be something there that's kind of tricky that you don't really walk, want to walk into until you have as much information as you can possibly get before Sharon, who you really want to have as much information on as you can possibly get. So that would be why for me, I might leave Destiny for a little later. Like when you see a potential minefield. Information gathering is key and part of that is charting. Part of that is organizing the information also. Okay, what about this last question? What else do we want to know about each of these people? Well, this isn't very specific, but just what they want, right? Like Sharon has a lot of power. What is Sharon in invested in? Um, things like that. Absolutely, yes. What they want out of the contract. Yeah, along the what you were just saying, Ida, for Destiny, like why she stopped um, being union rep. And I think for Paul, um, like why he's not a member of the union yet, if he isn't, because I don't think it's made clear whether or not he is. So for anyone who's not in the union yet, besides Sharon, like what has kept you from joining or staying particularly involved, I think is important. But also like maybe before that is just, how are you doing? So like, is Paul's job helping him take care of his very sick wife? Like, how's it going, Paul? Might be an easier start. Exactly what I was opening my mouth to say is like, we know that something has happened in the same way of like, we know that something has happened when destiny did a thing, like a, a something changed. Whenever you know that about someone, it's good to like, want to know why, because that will inform how they react to you. And the better prepared you can be for that, the better it's going to go. Whoop. Yes. Time check. 20 minutes. I'm super happy with those answers. I think we can wrap that up. Anybody have questions?
strong feelings. You disagree with our ordering. Everyone's wrong. Bad logic. No. <laughs> If nobody has questions, I just want to jump in and say that this exercise is from um, something called Strike School, which a few of us attended um, a few like last month. And um, I don't know if any of you, like Jane McAlevey, the big national union organizer, um, basically told us that they're like, this is something where you can basically say that there are right and wrong answers. Um, yay, yeah. Like, uh, it's, it's not necessarily a science, but there are like, well-tested rules and best practices. I hate that phrase, but like best ways of approaching um, organizing. Um, and, and so like, take, I, take that as you will, you know, I think that it, it, it's easy to like get too rigid about this kind of thing, but I personally also found it really helpful to know that this has been replicated like dozens if not hundreds of times before with great success. It's the old CIO model of like building big majorities in workplaces. And so I'm inclined to trust it but I know that people may have different feelings about that kind of thing. Yeah, thanks, Crystal. I feel the same way of like, we're learning this stuff because it has worked before. Maybe it's not gonna work for us and we'll figure out something better, but um, it's worth learning from at least. So with that, we know what charts are. We know what they look like. We know how to ID the people on them. What do we do with those charts? I'm gonna turn it over to Evan. <clears throat> yeah, that's a great question. Um, can we go back one slide? Thank you. Oh, no. I, nope. There we go. Sorry, I'm, I'm one of those people who doesn't do animations, but uh, <laughs> likes to have a separate slide to reveal things. Um, <clears throat> yeah, no, thank you so much, uh, Ida and Crystal, for uh, transitioning into um, this into structure tests and providing us with so much good information. Um, so now, okay, let's imagine we have, um, we've been charting, we have our charts, we have the nice physical charts, um, and we maybe potentially we have organic leaders, maybe not, um, but this is where the charts actually come in handy, and this is where we'll talk about structure tests. So a structure, well, first off, like, what do we mean by structure? So a structure is a place where people come together because they have to. So this is very different from um, like people who join a club because they're all interested in something. It's something they, uh, they're there because they have to. Like for example, tenants like in an apartment complex or for here, people who work in a same place. Um, and what you want to do with a structure test, uh, you're actually testing the, um, the power and the commitment of people within that structure. Um, it basically, it tells you how ready people are willing to do certain actions and how uh, faithful they are to doing actions repeatedly, if that makes sense. Um, we can go into it because it's, it's a very vague term, but it'll make sense, I promise. Um, so when, so a structure test is something that you have that has uh, several uh, requirements. It has to be public. So this test has to be something that, um, there has to be some level of risk involved. Um, so you have to be saying like, um, being very visible about uh, a decision. So for example, that could be signing your name to a petition. Uh, that could be wearing a, a union badge to work. Um, and that it has to be something that is only done within the structure itself. So for example, um, if I, a structure test I could have um, would be to ask everyone in my department, biology, uh, to sign this petition to um, provide dental insurance for us graduate students. Uh, but if we have that petition being signed by people, say in English or in anthropology or just in the Charlottesville community, um, that doesn't really tell us much about uh, the structure of our workplace because what we're focusing on is the, again, the integrity and the commitment of people within your workplace because that is where we are doing the organizing. Um, and you have to ask them to do it. It's not just something like they just happen to do because you want to have that evidence. So all, all everything we've talked about today is like all about evidence. You wanna have the evidence that people, uh, if you ask them to do something, they will do it. 
um, and they will do it publicly because ultimately what we're kind of building towards is our very large, so super majority um, actions that express our power. And the ultimate expression of a worker's power is a strike. But if you ask everyone to go on strike tomorrow, yes, thank you. If you ask everyone to go on strike tomorrow at UVA, are they gonna do it? At VCU? Not gonna do it. Um, so that's what structured tests are kind of designed to do. It's almost like a scaling up of doing very small actions that progressively get a little bit more, um, maybe a little bit more riskier, maybe a little bit more public until you are so, um, you are so like, you have enough evidence to say like, look, we have enough people who are willing to do this and this many number of people will do it. We are strike ready. Um, you don't have to do the strike. Um, you just have to at least show that we have the power to implement a strike. Because um, the threat can be as um, powerful as the strike itself a lot of times. Um, structure tests are also really important because in like building up to that, it tells us where we are strong in our departments, for example, or within the university itself or our workplace, um, and where is weak. So for example, um, uh, again, I'm going to take a department example. Like I could, if I have my big giant wall chart in my room, which I will, um, and I have like little indications of like people who've done certain structure tests, I can very quickly look at it and be like, okay, like all, all the grad students did this, none of the faculty did, or like, it looks like a lot of staff, uh, like we're like really in on this, but um, everyone on the third floor didn't. Like, that's really weird. It allows you to see like, okay, where do we need to invest our time and energy? Because like what was in the previous lessons, we wanna focus all of our efforts really on those people who are undecided. Like if you have someone already committed from the get-go, you don't need to further invest, you know, in convincing them or um, in that way. Because what, again, the, what we're trying to do is get numbers and committed numbers. Um, it also tells you um, about organic leaders, for example. So um, on our wall charts, uh, digital or physical, like you can also indicate people who are leaders and uh, say, for example, um, what would be a good example? Okay, let's, go. I'm gonna, let's keep using department. Uh, if let's say you recently recruited um, what you thought was an organic leader um, and they were someone like who you thought could get a significant number of faculty to join in um, on some sort of structure tests. Maybe it's uh, maybe it is signing like a, an open letter to the university administration um, and you do that and all the people you fought, like you fought there'd be a lot more faculty involved or something, and they're not there. That might tell you that that organic leader may not be as much as the leader as you fought, or maybe they are, they're just not able to, to gather people in that way. Um, so it's also really good for identifying, um, yeah, who are the leaders, who are the people who can motivate people, or maybe, maybe these people are just really friendly, but they're not great at getting people to do these little riskier actions. Um, I kind of uh, alluded to it earlier, but structure tests, again, they're public. They're within the structure of your workplace or wherever you are. And that could be like signing a petition, uh, signing a petition and attaching your picture to it, um, wearing union merch to work, showing up to an actual action or protest. And I guess the ultimate structure test is going on a strike. Um, again, these are, but these are designed to sort of be like incremental gradually getting more and more involved and in depth. And hopefully, um, with, and the goal is with each structure test, you increase the number of people who, um, who pass that test, essentially. Um, does that make sense so far? Awesome, cool. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Um, yes, so uh, as, as I alluded to, um, the structure tests uh, combined with this chart. So structure tests don't really mean anything if you're not tracking um, tracking development of like how many people are participating, who is participating, um, the relations between people, right? Because if you see someone who is uh, participating in a lot of structure tests and um, it shows like, oh, they're really good friends of X, Y, and Z, but those people haven't, um, participated that lets you know there's something to do. Um, joining a union, joining the union, 
uh, is in itself a sort of structure test. Um, because even though it's not, uh, technically it's not public, um, but it will at least tell you uh, who we can recruit, where should we recruit, um, and we'll kind of inform how we do the future structure tests. Um, yes, I've talked about who's participating in which actions, um, who is strong, who is weak. For example, that could be by floor, could be by position, um, uh, even shift, if like there's shift work, for example. Um, and that tells you like, okay, we need someone to tackle this, however you divide your structure of your workplace. Um, it helps you figure out like who needs to do what and where. Um, and it's also very important that structure tests and along with these charts of tracking the structure tests um, are not owned by the union. Um, they're not owned by me, they're not owned by Ida or Crystal. Uh, it's your, your workplace, you own the structure, you own the chart and you have those structure tests. Because again, it's you and your workers who are organizing um, to build power. So you decide like, you know, how to organize it. You decide like who, like you, like you decide like, okay, we need to work here. We need to work here. No one top down is gonna come and tell you what to do. It's, it's for your own benefit and it's for your uh, fellow coworkers benefit. Um, and that's why it's so important um, that it's, it's yours, it's your responsibility. And um, ultimately it benefits you and it benefits everyone because this is how you know when you're ready to fight and ready to win. Because if you don't have the structure test, you you're really going in blind. Um, you're not knowing like whether a certain action is going to really um, have the impact it can have or the power it can have because it's all about numbers. Um, and having that structure test is just another key piece of, or multiple structure tests is a key part of having that evidence to know that you, if we do this, we know we're gonna get at least this number of people and that gives us the best chance of getting what we want. Um, yes. And so what that might look like, if you wanna go to the next slide, uh, this is a beautiful wall chart from uh, oh gosh, I can't remember the acronym here. Uh, I believe it's a hospital. Um, if someone wants to chime in, if they remember. Um, oh, sorry, can we go back? Thank you. Um, I, I can't recall. But anyway, this is a structure or um, a, uh, a chart. And oh, a hospital in Philadelphia. Awesome. So you can see here um, very clearly we have people's names, right? We have uh, an AM shift and a PM shift. So it's divided by when they are working. Um, and each of these little dots represents or stickers represents a structure test. So for example, someone signed a union card, like they joined the union. Somebody uh, voted yes on a petition. That's a structure test. Any sort of participation essentially is like a structure test. Um, they filled out a survey, um, a, a negotiations petition. These are all forms of structure tests. And as long as you can track it and look at it. So for example, if, if someone were to look at this chart right now, uh, where would you say we need to focus on our efforts to either get people more involved in these structure tests or to you know, try to get them more into the union or maybe I, or identify a leader within that, um, that unit? if we're just looking at each, um, each big block of people, where, where should we focus our efforts uh, for the next structure tests in terms of recruiting and talking and that sort of thing? I guess both groups on the right-hand side in the AM and PM shifts. Yeah, exactly. So, so yes, within this division, um, I don't know how they're particularly characterized, but you can very see, like first glance, like these two are a little different from the rest, right? Everyone is nailing it on, <laughs> on these, the, the four to the left, but you can very, um, yes, Ida makes a great point. <laughs> it's obvious that that's the utility of a, of, a, of a chart and with structure tests. It tells you, very, like we're very visual creatures. Um, it tells you, where we need to focus our energy. 
so here, like we need to either, either if we already have an organic leader, maybe they aren't the leader we thought they were, um, or maybe we haven't identified one and we should, um, or maybe there's just something in particular that is just, um, that we really need to like gather more information and, or start talking to people to figure out why they are not participating in these various structure tests. Um, so you can see why going back, I, maybe it would have made more sense to show this first, um, but why structure tests are important because it's, it shows exactly like how cohesive uh, this unit is and where our work needs to be improved. Um, and yes, so when looking at the structure test, there's like two big things you need to see is like one, the structure itself of the workplace. So that's very obvious. You have AM, PM, you have these different units. And then what you need, to, what needs to happen. Um, so it's not merely just, you know, keeping track of information. It's, it's also, it informs you of what you should be doing. Um, and that's why charts are so cool. And that's why everyone in this meeting is going to have a physical chart and the digital one if they want. Um, yeah, do we wanna go to the next slide? Oh, yes. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to talk about this in particular, but if not, I can talk about it. Um, Crystal or Ida? I just wanna say that learning about leader ID and structure tests is like, for me, I'm really excited about this because this was the moment when I was like, oh, this is how we get to the win. Like, I understand why I want to be in a union. I understand what I want to get from the union. I understand structural organizing conversations. And I don't quite know how to get from point here to point the last point. And then I got it. Like, it's just this. You just iterate it. And it tells you what you need to know. And then you do that thing that I told you. And then you do it again. I love this stuff. Yes, exactly. It's not like... And this is a thing when people talk about, you know, what can a union do or like how much power do we actually have? Like it's, there's a system, there's a system and it's an evidence-based system. Um, and for example, like even though it makes all logical sense, right? Maybe it doesn't work in real life, but um, we do have countless examples of this actually succeeding. So uh, for example, there was an LA teachers union uh, strike, I believe in, oh God, I can't remember the year. Uh, it's somewhat recently, is that correct? Um, it was maybe three, two, three years ago. 2019. It was 2018 to 2019. Yes, so very recently. Um, so that was a 100% strike. Everyone went out and had a strike. Uh, we heard from during strike school, it's, it's incredible. Uh, think about LA, how big LA is, how big their school system is. 30, over 30,000 people, and they were able to pull this off. Um, we can do it in Richmond. We can do it at, in Charlottesville. We can do it anywhere. Um, and there's a hundred percent turnout, right? Uh, over 75, 70,000 people sh actually showing up to picket lines and actions. Almost a hundred, rounding error. Come on, hundred <laughs> percent. Um, but this is how they were able to achieve this, right? They used charts. They used, um, uh, structure tests. Does anybody want to guess like how many structure tests they did? So this this essentially from start to finish in planning and executing took about two years, I think is what the organizers said. Um, does anyone want to guess how many structure tests they um, overall they had to lead up to the strike? A lot. A lot. Ooh, we could do prices right rules. Do you want to hazard a hazard a number? So I was I was in um I used to be a teacher in New York City and I was in the union there when um Rudy Giuliani was the mayor. And uh you can guess how much fun that was and how lovely he was to teachers. And there was moments of like major mobilization. Uh, New York also had a Taylor law, which makes it illegal for teachers to strike, but um, but not this, right? And and like the groundwork for something like this uh, was not happening. So people were angry and would come out, but there was. So I'm imagining hundreds of these stress tests that they're doing along the way, like weekly. Okay, that's a good guess. Anyone else? Thousands. 
thousands. Okay, I, I, I see what you're all getting at. Um, let's assume like it's like there's one structure test for like like maybe let's assume that every school had the same structure test. Like that would count as one, right? Um, one structure test that all the schools and workers in those schools participated in. Uh, otherwise, yes, it would be in the hundreds of thousands. But there must have been a lot that happened before that structure test because, I mean, you've also got like 30 years of bad school policies all over the country. So they were already angry, but that, that's not enough. Mm -hmm. You got to have the organizing in place, the structure in place. Yeah. Um, so at least according to the organizers, um, as they planned this, uh, I think, and again, I'm going to have either crystal make sure I'm right. Uh, they had 12 structure tests. 12. Which is, it blows my mind. Um, oh, citywide. Yes, citywide. Yes, not like, yeah, like 12. The individual <laughs> schools were tests. organizing. There was probably a lot like, okay, let's see if we're going to show the principal that we're all going to wear union badges today. Or, exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So I had to clarify about number of schools and stuff. But uh, yes, 12, 12 structure tests over like the expanse of LA um, County schools. And um, which, yeah, like it, it actually, it really doesn't take a whole lot. Like they, they tell you so much information. Um, they tell you where you need to focus. And then if, you, if you're right and you're organized, um, you can be strike ready in a major city with, within a couple of years. So what does that tell us we can do in like a smaller city mm -hmm. or a town? The important thing to remember here is that they like went into those 12 structure tests knowing they wanted to be strike ready. So that needs to be your goal from day one as a union, um, which which honestly can be the hardest part, especially in a state like Virginia, where even the word strike, gets a lot of people scared. Um, these structure tests took place very publicly, like they told their bosses, like we're getting ready to strike, so be ready. And I think in a state like Virginia, that can be harder. But West Virginia Teachers Union, they did the exact same thing, illegal, but in the face of, you know, their employers pulled it off. I think that was 100% out. And so it can be done. Um, I don't think that we can, like, you know, necessarily replicate what happened in L.A., but there's definitely other cases for us to, to learn from. Absolutely. Thank you, Crystal. Yeah. And, yeah, Kentucky and Oklahoma as well. It's, again... It speaks to like the power of love of this method, really, um, and even like, having the threat right of a strike, even in an illegal place, you can't fire everyone. If you have like ninety eight percent turnout, you just can't do it. Um, I actually want to add one point to that: of you can't fire everyone when you also have the community. So for me, the 70,000 people coming to the picket lines and actions is also a really significant number because it shows that it wasn't just the teachers themselves inside their workplace. Organizing. It was also, they knew that the, their communities around them, that, that around the picket lines, they could go into people's houses and use their bathrooms, that people were bringing them snacks, that they had support, that people wouldn't cross the picket lines because you can fire everyone if you have that many people who will come in and take their jobs. So that's why it's also important to, um, when you do organizing conversations, when you do structure tests, to get at who else um, your coworkers know, what other community organizations there, and that's also part of organizing. Yes, thank you, Ida. Always, yeah, always a reminder, humans, workers, <laughs> as we are, we are multidimensional and we're not defined solely by our workplace. We have meaningful and more important connections outside the workplace that eventually, or at least in conjunction, can help us win. Um, and it takes all of us. And the way that we can't afford to not have the organic leaders, we can't afford to not have the community. We can do it. We just all have to do it together. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I think that's my yeah, that's my section. I will say uh, for digital charts, if anyone's interested, um, I've already made some uh, using, at least for UVA folks, uh, Gabriel, we might have to talk about Richmond. Um, like have, I have a list of like potentially like 
if, I don't think it's a hundred percent of every department, but it's a substantial majority that I can send you as like a very basic, like here are people's names, uh, the building they work in, their email, their phone number, whatever is publicly available, um, that can be provided and you can start a, a digital chart, um, which I think I've already done for my department. So, um, oh, and Ida, you've already, <laughs> you've already been doing it, which is great. Um, yes, Gabriel, please, let's, let, uh, you can email me if, if you don't have one already. Um, we can start, and this will be helpful for other people at VCU um, about how we can get like a nice, uh, clean data set to work with for other people who may be interested in this, these sorts of efforts. Yeah, so I guess, are there any questions for me or anyone else who's uh, spoken tonight? I got a question, like the ratings of one to four, it's hard, like, or, well, that seems, I mean, you're talking, I'm a researcher, so it seems hard to really figure out who's a one, two, three, four. Also, the organic leaders, sometimes they're organic leaders in certain contexts and considered activists in other contexts, right? Like, So how do you figure that out? Do you have an example in mind? Uh, for, the, for the organic leader part, like I would say I'm kind of one in my department. I've done enough for enough people. Um, they know that I can be a pain, but that I'm also like, I follow through, I, I you know, but I think in terms of like, the school of education as a whole, no. Hmm. And that has to do with some stuff that happened. But like, um, so, you know, th there's, there's organic leaders might have their like, like squad that they can kind of influence, but it doesn't necessarily go beyond that. It might be negative beyond. How do you make that, like, what have you, your experiences in terms of making those distinctions? I would say, um, since we're trying to start at the department level, because we're kind of all baby unions right now, or baby chapters, um, find the people who can move at the department. Um, once you get a majority of your department in the union, which is what we're really shooting for, um, it becomes really easy to, easier to have those school-wide fights uh, because you've got significant majorities in a majority of departments. And then you can start looking for people who are really good at advocating on your behalf, um, say, in the College of Arts and Sciences or, or what have you, or a staff, staff senate or a faculty senate, right? Um, I think starting small is, is, is okay. Um, we don't need that person ne right now necessarily who like will get up and like go to bat for the union in faculty senate. Um, although if we can get them, that's great. Um, but I, I know we personally have been focusing on our departments and really trying to build significant majorities there. I don't know if any, I don't know if they're like deferring. Um, I, I, have no, I don't know if I have the right answer on that at all, though. I actually think that the like more restricted organic leaders an organic leader is always going to be in a particular context, like whether that context is the whole workplace, all of UVA, or it's something smaller, or it's a faith community, or whatever. Like an organic leader is in something, some chunk of people. And I don't ever think that we get to a point where we don't need organic leaders at every level, at every chunk. So people like you who are able to be an organic leader in a, in a department, but not outside of it, remain important. Because every time that we do something, we're gonna have the organic leaders in every like level of chunk of people moving everyone around them. So yeah, we wanna start there. We also wanna keep it, <laughs> keep there. I don't know if that actually answers your question. It does. I mean, I think there's there's an art to this. It's us with the science. And like, you know, knowing when to make the move, when to have the conversation. But it's this is very useful. I like, I really like 
Um, I, so, I also I have to say, I teach graduate students and I'm being taught and it's so much fun for me to just sit back and let you guys answer the questions. It's really lovely. We're so glad to do that for you. <laughs> yes, we have passed the one hour mark. So if you need to head out, feel free. Um, I, I had one quick question or not a comment, I'm sorry. Um, with your wall charts or even your digital charts, um, again, they're yours. If you don't like, or like if you want to assign like a column for leadership and then just either have like an asterisk or some sort of code or even just a note saying like, for this, they're great. For this, maybe not. Um, also with assessing people, right? If you don't want to do a one through four scale, if there's something that's a little bit easier that still achieves that sort of like you can look instantly and get an idea of what needs to be done, it's up to you, right? It's your chart. So there is, of course, there's always flexibility. Cool. Are there any more questions? No. Am I, is it, am I the one who asked it in the meeting? <laughs> Let's call it. That was okay. great. Let's call it. Yes. I hope. Uh, yeah. I hope you all learned uh, something and are think already thinking about leaders, thinking about what your charts look like. Um, Seriously, though, like, like really emphasizing, like, get a physical chart. Like, let us know. We'll send you one. We uh, have 50. Yeah, okay. we have 50, which is awesome. Um, get some extras for your friends, right? Uh, yeah, no, this is great. And I think... Um, and so you have all the data from Workday and then for all the different departments? Correct. Are you going to send that out to all of us? or? Yes, I can do that. So I think... Uh, Ida and Sophia, you have anthropology. Yes. If more information or stuff, let me know. Um, Eli, I, I got you with uh, BME and data science. Like I said, Gabriel, <laughs> we, we need to figure out uh, Richmond. So the way we did it was um, we used, I don't know if you all use Workday for like your HR deposit system. Um, basically, like we, there's like a pub, like there's, it's so weird. Like we were able to see every worker who's paid by the university board of rectors, blah, blah, blah. Um, and that's what we've been in. It shows their position and all this information. If there's something similar in Richmond, that'd be awesome. If not, we're, there are other ways of uh, getting that information. There is something, I mean, you know, our, because we're all work for the state, our salaries are public. You can Google it. Um, right. So, yeah. Okay. I'm in a smaller unit too, because we're in a department, but we're also in a school of ed. It's not huge. We're all in one building. I know everybody. Everybody knows each other. Well, that's, yeah. Like if, yeah, that's even better, right? Like you can just, yeah. it sucks, but you can just go to the, you know, the, the website and just look up everyone. And... Yes. I'll just say one last thing. If you do end up doing what we did, which is like using some kind of script to scrape whatever system you use for names and info. Um, I would just encourage people to copy paste that information for their respective departments and put it somewhere private so that you're not broadcasting membership information on a publicly shared spreadsheet. I know people have been doing some of their charting on the spreadsheet I just shared and I'm gonna go nudge them to go take that somewhere else just because that's like proprietary information that no one else in the union even really needs to know. And sometimes you'll share like department dirt and stuff like that. And that's just not something that like we care to get at.